it's a pleasure being here. Um, such a lovely day as well. Uh, the slides are going to, um, should have been improved a bit. I, I wasn't sure if I was addressing a, an audience of, acad of experts or students, even though students normally are better experts than academics because they are fresher. Um, let me, before I go to the argument, which is uh, basically how we should shape the social contract, the public contract that underpins financial markets, that agreement between um, market participants and the governments as to what markets should do, which of course a neoliberal would tell you that doesn't exist. The markets are uh, self-regulated and uh, a, a self-emerging uh, institution. Obviously, I think the theory is wrong. But let's take things from the beginning, something that is obviously not evident in my slides that uh, start with the conclusion, <laughs> as you do in an academic conference and then you explain the methodology. Um, they are a, an adaptation of my slides. I presented the same, well, a worse <laughs> talk at Yale um, uh, last week at the Wasserman uh, Law and Finance uh, workshop. So obviously, before an academic audience, you start mm -hmm with the conclusion because they get bored. <laughs> Hopefully you will not because I will start uh, from the beginning. And what's the beginning? The beginning is that in 2008 we had a massive crisis. The global financial uh, system nearly collapsed. Or if you will, to be more accurate, the Western financial system uh, nearly collapsed. And what we had after that was a wave of regulations what is regulation of the markets? It's public ordering or private relationships. You know, for my um, contract law uh, colleagues, for my private law colleagues, law is the decisions of the courts and the statute. For me, law is an economic institution. Every contract is an economic institution to be deconstructed and analyzed accordingly. Um, you would think that we don't work in the same <laughs> Uh, place in the same. I think um, traditional lawyers and um, uh, law and economics uh, lawyers do not share much, but uh, I hope that's not on the record. Uh, well, it is. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> 2008 is a major incident, it is probably a bigger incident than the crash in 1929 because it's more globalized. What happens next is that governments pass a wave after wave after wave of restrictive regulations. And everybody says now the world will be, the markets will be more stable and the world will be better. Um, you've heard the names of uh, those statutes and of course the Dodd-Frank is the most famous. But of course, for each of those statutes, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of implementing legislation or implementing regulation. And these regulations, uh, which admittedly have enhanced the short-term stability of the markets and the short-term stability of financial institutions, um, are extremely complex. And um, also, God knows if they are misguided or well-guided. Only a new crisis will prove that. But what my research does is it identifies another problem with these waves of new legislation. They encourage short-term as opposed to long-term finance. Under the new liquidity and capital regulations, there is no bank in Europe that lends you money more than five years. Now, a shipping company, for instance, and these are, or a mortgage. A mortgage is 25 years normally, and the shipping company needs certainty about the rate of refinancing. That's the most important thing um, for the next 20 or 25 years. If you only lend me money, for five years and I'm in trouble, I cannot restructure and I will go insolvent for no reason whatsoever. And if I go insolvent for no reason whatsoever, that's 
that's a serious damage to the economy because everybody will uh, get less than they would guess. The social, the social uh, surplus will be much lower. The product from the transaction that I'm involved, from the business that I'm involved, will be much less than would have been the case if the company kept going, having secured a long -term, its long-term funding basis. Okay, so, and the other thing is that we need long-term finance because think how long it takes to go from Annandale to New York. Why? Because there's not enough, there's not enough infrastructure around. And while there's not enough infrastructure around, you cannot rely on the state any longer. Most Western states are around 100% um, debt to GDP, which means they're nearly insolvent. So if you wait, if you expect public money to come into play in order to finance your infrastructure, they won. Okay, it will not happen. But on, uh, at the same time, we don't face a liquidity crisis. On the contrary, there's a surplus of funds moving around, and um, they run in the trillions. And what do they do? They chase minuscule returns on short-term financial instruments, which are the core of what we call shadow banking. Okay, lots of money, instead of going to the real economy, goes to shadow banking uh, operations, chasing returns of 0.01%. Or they stay with the central bank because there is also, at the same time, a crisis of um, confidence. So, um, if you open the New York Times, you will see that um, Krugman talks about the liquidity trap all the time. If you open the Washington, the Washington Post, you will see that Summers talks about secular uh, stagnancy, secular stagnation. Both mean that it's not worth people's while to invest long term. Now that's paradoxical because interest rates are nearly negative. If you open any economics textbook, it will tell you that investment depends on the cost of capital. Here, the cost of capital is sometimes below zero. Okay, there, is, there are massive amounts of, in, of funds going around which are not committed long term. They just either stay with the central bank getting negative rates or move around and around and around and around to chase 0.01% returns, doing nothing productive. Because obviously the contracts in which that short-term money is invested are all speculative, are all bets. Instead of betting on a horse race, you bet on a derivative. Okay, now um, the paper starts with, um, starts with a few important assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that um, there is a middle ground between Adam Smith who thought that markets are a self-emerging institution that is only accountable to market participants and through competition it increases efficiency and Polanyi, who was saying that markets are a governmental, more or less, a governmental institution. So this middle ground tells you that markets exist because the governments tolerate them. If not, if not reinforce their function through the infrastructure, the legal, the regulatory infrastructure that the state provides. Okay. You don't have an important market these days, post-2008, without that regulatory infrastructure augmenting and supporting their function. And the question is, what should be the targeting of that public ordering? So far, the only thing that we have seen is that short-term stability will cure all. And the uh, paper says short-term stability will not cure all because A, 
Financial stability in general may be an illusion. And here Minsky comes into play if you have read the financial instability hypothesis. And his other writings, most of them produced here at the Levy Institute, or he worked. Markets are in a, a, and economies, where finance is important, are in a state of constant flux. They are never really stale and stable. That's an illusion. The second thing is, even if they are relatively stable, do they maximize allocations? The, the, the fundamental assumption of the social contract that underpins financial markets is that they boost growth. We have financial markets because finance is essential to fund projects in the real economy. If most of the money is uh, moving around in self-referential contracts and is not, the money is not channeled to the real economy, what you have is, in economic terms, wastage even if the market is relatively stable. Of course, a market with lots of short-term flows cannot be stable forever because short-term flows boost volatility. And volatility is a major enemy of confidence. And if I don't have confidence in the markets and the return that I will get from the market, I will not invest. So essentially, what we are doing today, stabilizing the system in the short term, does nothing and tells us nothing about long-term allocations. If you want to maximize long-term allocations, you should go further beyond the objective. You should go beyond the objective of short-term stability because nobody knows what long-term financial stability looks like and generate fashion device incentives that maximize commitment finance. What we call long-term finance means commitment finance, that you stay there, put on the contract for much longer than a second. Probably five years should be the benchmark. Now, obviously, long-term finance has serious issues. In principle, it's, a, a, it's illiquid. Secondly, it's very hard to calculate the return. How much is going to be your profit? I have some answers, but let's, um, let's now take things from where we stand today. We have a very extensive financial stability. We have very extensive, very complex, very detailed, very comprehensive consumer protection financial stability regulation to do what? To protect investors and, and uh, protect the short-term stability of the financial system. None of those, none of those devices maximize lo uh, long-term allocations because they are not supposed to. It's thought that, um, it's thought that um, stable markets will maximize long-term allocations on their own. And I say that's wrong. That's wrong because financial stability is an illusion, Minsky, and that's wrong because what they do, as a matter of fact, is they take advantage of QE, of negative rates, what we call extraordinary monetary policies, all this excess supply, to build up leverage and take short-term bets in the market. Instead of, uh, if you think about derivatives contracts on, uh, let's say, the exchange rate between the pound and the dollar. Okay, it's no different than betting on go-go uh, champion in the Kentucky horse race. Okay, or taking a bet on the Red Sox winning the series this year as well. Basically, that's what it is. Social value zero.
Another problem with all that regulation, apart from the fact that nobody understands it, is that prevents, and that's in the next slide, is that it prevents the suppliers of long-term finance contracts to reach the natural buyers, pension funds, and the investment public. So they restrict demand, uh, they restrict demand because suitability, client suitability, are you suitable for the investment? Because suitability and um, financial advice restrictions prevent a major infrastructure provider to go to the public and sell 40 year long bonds. That's regarded as a complex contract and current legislation does not allow you to buy that. Okay, obviously there are good reasons for that, but thinking that a four term, a four year, a 40 year term project infrastructure, project bonds is like the Lehman mini bonds or the uh, collateralized debt obligations that destroyed the world, I think that's flawed thinking. And there are restrictions, of course, on the supply side, because as I said, nobody provides loans more than five years because legislation, current regulation, that's financial stability regulation, prevents them from doing so. If you do that, you need to set aside for every financial contract, for every loan that banks provide these days, they need to set aside the capital and the liquidity charge. Some assets aside to work as capital reserves and some cash aside which means that the more they the longer they lend the less they lend their their funding is not unlimited so if for every for every contract that you supply you keep aside a certain amount of money both as a liquidity and the capital uh, a capital reserve the longer is that charge, the higher is that charge, the less you lend. Okay, you start diminishing your money, what you have available to lend out faster. But if you lend less, you make less money. Okay, so they take the easy way out, and which is lending more, but at much shorter maturities. Okay. It's not very difficult to understand it. So they don't provide long-term instruments, apart from equities, apart from shares, especially to those who need long-term instruments like, um, like my pension fund, which instead goes out and gets any kind of junk in the credit markets, um, any kind of securitized junk or stupid contract, in order to get 0.2% uh, return, which is massive, because in the current environment, they are nothing. Okay. So, both current regulation is um, uh, restricting both supply and demand for long-term contracts. It restricts supply because of capital and liquidity regulations. It restricts demand because of suitability and consumer protection regulations. Okay, which are very vogue as well. If you support uh, at the back of, um, of a, an abhorrent financial service industry and abhorrent consumer protection standards, um, the regulation of everything and the prohibition of everything, you become a, you become a Massachusetts uh, senator. So, uh, politics, of course, have a role here. Whether you are 
a presidential candidate that hugs Goldman Sachs bankers, or a far brand Democratic senator promoting or opposing the financial services industry builds political careers, big time. But the job of an academic is not to build, at least outside the United States, to build a political career. The job of an academic is to look for the facts. And the facts are, lots of this is probably unnecessarily protective, complex, and uh, incomprehensive. And um, something that is so complex and very, people, uh, uh, very few people understand is a systemic risk in itself. Now, markets sometimes, and I, I, I support the adaptive capital market hypothesis. I don't think that um, financial markets comprise super geniuses, as Professor Fama believes. And I do not believe that financial markets comprise idiots, as, pro as Professor Schiller believes. As you know, two years ago, the Academy, the Swedish Academy, decided that both Islam and Christianity are great religions and split the uh, prize between Christ and uh, Muhammad. OK, <laughs> because this is exactly what they did <laughs> in order not to take sides. So um, I don't believe that either of them is wrong, totally wrong, or either of them is totally right. There is another, uh, another theory by Professor Andrew Law of MIT that says that markets uh, even if they start from an initial position of uh, uh, a collection of idiots or imbeciles, they learn. And eventually they adapt and they move towards, um, towards creating efficiencies. I believe for that to happen, you need to provide incentives to market players. Now, why long-term finance? Because it has a very strong social utility. Also, as I said, because markets are not just comprising rocket scientists or imbeciles, but they adapt, they have their own natural stabilizers. And um, the best stabilizer is if you and I do two different things. Our investment risk is not correlated. Because if a crisis comes, only one of us will fail, not both. If we both do, and this is what happened in 2008, everybody was doing the same thing. If we both do the same thing, we'll fall together and in sync. And there will be nothing to pick us up. But if we do two different things, only one of us will fail. But for the investors of the institution that will fail, but the financial system will be able to regain its natural balances and its natural stability through turbulence. As I have already explained, as a matter of fact, Mitski has explained it, the more you build leverage, the less stable the system will become. And you inevitably build leverage in good times because you, for behavioral reasons as well, everybody is prone to overborrowing or overlending, overconfidence. So, um, Long-term finance gives me more stable markets. The more diverse are the things that we do, the less likely is that we'll f fail together. One of us will fail, but not both. As I've already said, but for the investors of the failing institution, but the market overall will not collapse. OK. Now. What are the productive uses of finance? Which, I repeat, is an allocative mechanism and not a redistributive mechanism. If you want to redistribute wealth, you have the government for that, and you have taxes. The markets are not there to redistribute wealth. The markets are there to allocate resources. What can long-term finance do? First of all, Investment in infrastructure, 
open any paper today. Why would you not invest in infrastructure? Really, why? <laughs> With 130%. <laughs> With really 130% debt to GDP ratio <laughs> for half of the developed uh, nations. Why we're not investing in infrastructure? Why? <laughs> because we don't want taxes to move to 80%. Whoever does that will not be reelected, correct? So there must be another way. And there are trillions around, trillions circulating around that they do nothing productive. So how can we make them do what? Invest in infrastructure, research and development, productivity, new jobs. All the things that in a capitalist society rebalance inequality. What it does not balance inequality is lots of short-term liquidity. Because if I have 100 houses and you have one, I can take 100 different bets in the markets. I can collateralize that asset, let's assume it's a house, and take 100 bets. Okay. And obviously the bet will be 90% higher than the value of the collateral. Okay, the collateral is just my margin. So, I never lose. If your bet goes wrong, you have lost your house. Okay, so the more I win, the richer I become. Correct? Now, why you don't feel poor? You don't feel poorer because all that surplus that they have in funds, because they become richer and richer and richer by working out, out capital. Instead of making capital investments, long-term investments, I'm just betting capital short-term on the basis of my existing asset base. And they become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And what do I do with that liquidity? I put it in the bank that gives you subprime mortgages. So when, while this is happening, you don't feel poorer. But when the crisis, the crunch comes, you're destroyed. Okay. So not only my wealth is multiplying, whereas yours is undermined, when crisis happens, yours disappears. Mine, if it takes a hit, it will be much less compared to my total wealth to yours. But the other reason that mine probably will not be affected at all is why would my wealth be affected when crisis comes? And they ask what I have bo borrowed. Huh? The funds, the banks will ask for what I have borrowed back. So my wealth will be affected if I start selling my assets, fire sales, and lose money of the value of the assets. But with QE and negative rates, I don't need to, I don't need to sell anything. I'll just refinance, I'll just borrow at the lower interest rate. Okay. So, this process of multiplying my wealth, even in a crisis, if you have quantitative easing and negative rates, will go on and on and on while you are threatened with a repossession. This is why short termism and these expansionary monetary policies, which clearly have not worked in boosting long-term capital investment have increased in quality. Not to mention the long-term financial stability impact that probably destabilize markets. But of course, the question is how can I extricate them from taking, from taking bets on the go-go champion at the Kentucky Derby to invest in infrastructure? And the answer is you need to refashion incentives. You need to stop thinking that by building a panoply, a financial stability or a consumer protection panoply, you have done much for the economy. In order to direct to order the markets to put their money into long-term capital uses, you need to give the, ma the markets incentives to do so. And of course the markets arbitrage all the time. The markets multiply financial instruments all the time. 
whatever you create, the markets will dice and slice it to make it a short-term trading instrument. Unless they can't. Unless they are not allowed. And what's the um, legal system? What's the legal ordering that will prevent them from doing so? Intellectual property rights. Why specific companies and not everybody else can sell cancer drugs? Because it's that company that has the patent, that has the legal right from the inventor to manufacture and sell the drug. Everybody else who will do that will go to court because it's an illegal activity. So you need the intellectual property rights to patent these long-term instruments so that control multiplication. And I have explained that um, the two most important issues which are I suggest that you create these long-term funds, which exclusively sell long-term instruments. And the answer is, OK, you talk about diversification, but you, now you talk about lots of funds that are focused on a single line of investment. What happens if they fail? In a systemic stability context, nothing. That's why we have what is called macroprudential. Nothing. The markets, the, the, the stability of the financial system is undermined and threatened and contagion happens when we all do the same. When they are is homogeneity, when we all lend to the supply markets and then we engineer those products and we sell them as securitized debt. Then if anything happens to the housing markets, we'll all fail. But if you lend to the housing markets and I build bridges, why should I care what happens to the housing market in two or three years? The maturity of my investment is for 40 years. There is an issue there. Who's going to buy them because they will not be able to resell? But I will explain how this is going to be resolved by the market. And obviously, housing is, is long-term, but it's very dodgy. If you want to create, as I suggest, special asset classes that I will enjoy, tax and regulatory privileges, and special investment institutions that they will enjoy, tax and regulatory privileges, you need to forget about housing, unless it's social housing. OK, because housing has proved to be, in the Western world, outside continental Europe, a very risky proposition, a very risky investment. But how about a Tobin tax or a financial transaction tax? Well, that, because you, you need incentives to take the money from the short-term markets to the long-term markets. That, as far as I understand it, is meant to dampen speculation to slow down the uh, speed of trading or to generate money that can be used into a fund to boost the stability of the financial system, the solvency of financial institutions. How this would take money from the short-term markets to the long-term markets, I understand not. And now, about consumers. Let's think about my pension fund, about retail investors. My pension fund is overinvested in UK equities. Faces a massive deficit, more than 10 billion, as a matter of fact. But uh, it's overinvested in UK equities that today are doing extremely well because there's so much liquidity that's going to the uh, stock markets. OK, so lots of buyers, lots of money. Valuations go to the goods, pricing goes to the goods. If the stock market, when the, all that liquidity injection from the central bank stops and the market goes the other way, think what's going to happen to the deficit. Now, if my, if my 
pension fund held instead a 40-year project bond that would give it 2.5 per year or 4.5 per year, it would know what are the returns on that investment for 40 years. I repeat, there are two issues. What happens in default and the liquidity issue? If you want to resell, who's going to buy it? I will return to that because it's not difficult at all. Can I protect consumers from risk? Am I protected from the risk of the um, London Stock Exchange collapsing? No, I will get no pension. With all the suitability, with all the uh, regulatory restrictions in the world, I still face the prospect of getting no pension. Correct. Why is it different with the 40-year project bond? And also, let's remember our financial economics, our finance. Finance is not a useless subject. If there is a risk of default, that should be in the price. That should be in the price. The risk of default is priced at the interest rate premium. If that's a risky borrower, I ask for a higher interest rate. OK. We cannot forget financial economics. We cannot forget our finance. So the risk of default should be reflected on the interest rate. And if it's not, you can sue them under general fraud and civil liability statutes. OK. So either you are paid the risk year by year by year because you get a higher interest, or if you are defrauded, you sue. And how about liquidity? I'm sure you have all heard about this fintech platforms, a new generation of digital trading platforms. Uh, Jan has more interesting stories than me to say, but the uh, story that I have to say is that I can say is two weeks ago the pound crashed. Why did the pound crash? Because a robot, an artificial intelligence chip, read a newspaper article and started selling the uh, British pound like there is no tomorrow. So a robot crashed the pound. That much for market efficiency. But they have their benefits. And what are their benefits? What is the problem? What is the problem to generate liquidity for a 40-year-long project bond? Due diligence, the contract, the assumptions, this, that. All that, all that can be stored in a digital form, in a digital form, in one of those digital platforms. Whereas, of course, with confidentiality agreements and so on. So whereas before, in order to do my due diligence on that product, I needed to spend serious money and time. Now I need to spend no, no money whatsoever. And as for time, whatever it takes to read the documents. OK, so that's a massive change. That's a catalyst to generate liquidity. And as a matter of fact, this is not science fiction. The big institutional investors, the uh, pension funds and so on, what they do these days, because they chase returns, and what you get normally 0.01%, is they go into those platforms and buy and sell stakes in venture capital investments, and private equity investments, which were thought as illiquid in the past. This is happening as we speak. And as for the security of those transactions, blockchain. Blockchain is not about Bitcoin. We think it's a blockchain is a new technology that creates an inviolable record of your transactions and, and of what happened before. And of course, in the past, the infrastructure did not have the technical capability to hold all that data. These days, with the big data, being very easily transferable and shareable on these platforms, liquidity will not be an issue because the world is full of long-term investors who find not enough long-term investments 
to put their money or the incentives are insufficient. So liquidity in 2016 for long-term instruments is not really an issue. They used to be liquid. There is no reason for those instruments to be liquid in the future. I explained why regulation is an issue. It restricts supply and it restricts demand. And um, obviously, I like concepts. I like ideas. And um, also, I'm a professor of law and economics. I am not in love with empirical work. Uh, I, I think you should have the idea and the concept first and then test it empirically. As you know, today's economics is that you first test empirically something that you might have in the future as an idea or a concept. You know, an issue of choices and preferences. But is there any empirical basis for what I'm saying? Because empirics are important. Well, there is. Capital investment in the United States in 2015 fell. Capital investment is long-term investment by corporations. Real investment, real economy investment. Fell. And this couldn't happen according to Summers and DeLong because the cost of capital is zero. Or very close to zero. And any economics textbook will tell you that the rate of capital investment depends on the cost of capital. See, the cost of capital is nothing. But capital investment is not rising and spends a wash. have provided convincing research that says that the money, as a matter of fact, has gone to short-term investments like share buybacks. They use the cash or they burn the cash in order to build share prices. OK. Now, if I have lots of cash available and I just return it to you, for investing that probably is worth less, that's social wastage. That's not efficiency. Overpaying for anything because I have lots of cash to burn is social wastage. It's not efficiency. OK. So um, and let me show you what they mean. From 2008. Onwards, capital investment in the United States, which is this line, has been much lower than other recessions that there was no QE. 1990. 1973. So, Spence and Walsh prove that in conditions of extraordinary monetary policies, in an environment where the cost of capital is zero, capital investment is not rising. And on the other hand, the long and summers say that could not be happening. But it's happening. So what's the explanation? I think the explanation is that the regulatory environment is discouraging long-term investment. And uh, that's not just a company that wants to borrow for the long term, but also the supplier that wants to lend or invest for the long term. And I also think that there are serious tax disincentives in the system that they need to be looked at. Now, why do we need a boost to long-term investment? Notwithstanding the fact that uh, for 60 miles from New Haven to JFK, it takes four and a half hours. OK. That's Calcutta, Calcutta level speed. OK. But we talk about the, the biggest country in the world and the biggest economy. 
Have you ever thought about the man hours that are lost due to lack of investment, of in, uh, investment in infrastructure? Why infrastructure investment has gone down as a share of the GDP? Because the state and the federal states in the United States are not investing any longer. Why they are not investing? Because they have accumulated massive piles of debt, which is not easily liquidated, especially in an environment of very low inflation. Okay, unless they make lots of people homeless and they create serious amounts of social unrest. And if you do that, what's the value of building more public infrastructure? Okay, but as I said, there's plenty of private funding. There's plenty of private capital that stays stale. The same is the, uh, the uh, situation in Europe. This is from the European Investment Bank, even though the slide is a bit misplaced. As you can see, the gap, what is required for the European economy to stay at the same level of competitiveness as currently is with Japan, the United States, and so on, and what is the funding inflow to the European economy in terms of long-term investment. And what is long-term investment? Research and development, key strategic sectors, transport, equipment, machinery, life sciences, renewable energy, eco-innovation. Okay, it's well-defined. Gap required from the private sector 200 billion, current investment 130. Required from the, that's the private sector. The gap is 70 billion, at the same time there are trillions gambled around the shadow banking system or the forex markets. And the gap for the public sector is 60 billion, much expected because most of the eurozone, at least outside Germany and the Netherlands, is bankrupt. If we take the Rogoff and I had benchmark of 90% debt to GDP, all of the Western Europe plus the United States is bankrupt. But even if you take the 100% of the GDP as a benchmark, most of the eurozone countries are way above that benchmark. So who's going to invest? Where are they going to find the money? The answer is the private sector, but the private sector needs incentives because what the private sector does right now is it invests on derivatives that are called go-go champion at uh, the global derivatives markets which serve as the Kentucky race, as the Kentucky Derby. And I have explained how we can create liquidity for long-term instruments through the fintech platforms. Which is a great relief because admittedly most long-term investments, project bonds, project guarantees, were illiquid. And thus they only attracted, they only attracted strategic long-term investors like the state. What I say is that there is no reason to restrict funding to those actors any longer because fintech is pretty capable of creating a secondary market for these instruments. And as a matter of fact, this is what has already done for venture capital and private equity stakes. So since they have done it for other forms of investment that were considered illiquid in the past and why they were considered illiquid because of the level of due diligence and information that you had to, to obtain. You can do it for long-term investments as well. I have no doubt whatsoever. Now, which tools, what incentives? I think the regulatory burden for issuers of long-term debt should be lightened, should be much reduced. If I am diversified, the financial stability risk is lower, 
there is no reason to overregulate me. That's stupid regulation. It's no productive regulation, it's stupid regulation. I know I sound like a Wall Street libertarian, but I'm anything but that. I'm just, a, I'm just a, an apostle of common sense. If you don't want to trust the existing financial institutions, create new classes, new forms of financial institutions that do long-term investment, and new asset classes. Require the issuers to comply with prescribed standards, you standardize the product, and you give the issuers intellectual property rights to control the multiplication of derivative investments on the bonds or whatever other instrument they are issuing, otherwise you will lose the ball. Okay. And also make these instruments that carry a 40 year long risk, of course, maturity risk and so on, available to institutional and retail investors that they are, protect, are overprotected today. And why they are overprotected? In order not to buy Lehman mini bonds, which were the most complex financial instrument in the world and were sold by people who uh, would be selling groceries, by the way, or, or mobile phones. They were being sold in Hong Kong by people who were as qualified as selling at the same time mobile phones as a, a, a product that is nearly as simple as a deposit. Okay. But in protecting investors and consumers, retail investors, from this kind of very complex and toxic product, you also protect them because legislation has gone on the other, regulation has gone on the other end, you also prevent them from getting any long-term investment exposure in the markets. And I think that's wrong. There is a higher risk that um, when you lend money for 40 years, the borrower will go bankrupt. Fine. I put it in the interest rate. I increase the premium. There is a higher risk of fraud. Fine. I refine my fraud and civil liability regime. What I do not do is prevent them from matching their long-term savings needs with the long-term investment needs of society. Now, and if they want to resell, I explained that the liquidity issues, the secondary market issues, will be resolved by technology if they have not already been resolved. And then, it's the issue of tax. If my income comes from lots of derivatives transactions, 50%. If my income comes from dividends in a social housing corporation or in a 50 year long term, 10% tax. Now, why we shouldn't stick to tax? We shouldn't stick to tax because I think the regulatory burden, empirically, now I think that's the case, for long-term finance is very high. When the European shipping industry, which is in very big trouble, cannot refinance its long-term debts, and lots of shipping companies will go bankrupt for no reason, and you know, that's a very cyclical, it's like housing. It's a very cyclical industry. The ship costs nothing, costs five million today, 50 million in two years if the Chinese market opens again. Okay. So you talk about depreciations over appreciations depending on the time that you liquidate the asset of a thousand percent difference. Why? Because it's a very cyclical market depending on trends on global trade. Okay. Even if you say that the Greek, the Greek ship owners, come on, even that, they play with a cycle. And they provide the true service. And you send them out of business. Why? Because the banks are restricted from lending long term. And the same is the case 
in a series of other investments. If you will, the same is the case with the recapitalization of the European banking sector especially. If from that pool of investors that have money, nobody is allowed to buy a 40-year bond charging the corresponding interest per year of a European bank that is verging on collapse these days, betting on the macroeconomic cycle and the value of the asset becoming from 5 million to 50 million, okay, the European banks will never be recapitalized, recapitalized unless that is done by the state, but that's prohibited. The state is prohibited in Europe from bailing out banks any longer. So by restricting long-term investment, you restrict long-term investment opportunity, which could resolve a number of current and future problems. And the other reason that regulation should be involved is because regulation is easier when it comes to finding a global consensus than tax. All the regulations passed post-2008, the European capital regulations, the Dodd-Frank and so on, they are not the same, but they look alike. And they look alike because there is a group of 20, that's the 20 biggest economies in the world, the G20 is the group of 20, China included. Input. The leaders or the finance ministers of the wealthiest 20 countries in the world agree in the general principles and the fundamentals and the detail follows and of course the detail differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction because they also compete with each other. But the fundamental principles are the, st the same. So regulation, if you will, it's an advantageous field to find a global consensus, which I very much doubt you can find with tax. And there are other advantages as well. I believe that the only way to make um, long-term investment attractive, apart from the issue of liquidity, is to make it cheaper. Lower, and by making it cheaper, what do I mean? Lower the tax burden and lower the regulatory burden. You also provide a moral signal, a nudge. It's like telling people, do you know what? Short term bets, not good. In the same way that you regulate gambling, or alcohol consumption, or drug consumption, not good. then obviously you create an unlevel playing field. Long-term finance is preferred over short-term finance. It's a serious, serious public intervention in private markets. But isn't that, aren't those markets boosted, supported by a public order, a public order system, a system of public ordering? What is the targeting of that system of public order? If it is short-term financial stability and protecting consumers from all risks, as it seems to be today, it's incomplete. Because it does not answer society's, economies, long-term funding needs. So I think there is a very strong economic, not moral, economic, justification for an unlevel playing field, for preferring long term from building a public ordering system for financial markets that prefers long term over short term finance instead of being neutral, as it is today, and expecting the market to sort out the mess. Empirical research says, and empirical evidence says that the market is unable to sort out this mess because of the availability of leverage. The more leverage, the more the temptation to speculate short term.
if I give them the incentives, will they adapt? Well, there are three approaches here. Market actors are imbeciles and they will never adapt. Market actors are rocket scientists and they don't need to adapt because they know it already. And the third approach, the Andre Law approach, that they will adapt gradually through learning and experience. I'm a supporter of the third approach. I think they will adapt, and not only they will adapt, they will also create uh, derivatives products, like the K. Schiller index derivatives and so on, that will have, they will target long-term markets and they will provide hedging opportunities against the risks in the long-term investment markets. That's what I believe is going to happen. Now, is regulation enough? No, you need tax incentives. The stronger the tax incentive, the stronger the, uh, the uh, stick, the bigger the carrot in this case. But am I hopeful that the fiscal consensus at a group of 20 level will be achieved? No. Not for the time being. And in actual terms, in terms of market function of market operations, are there benefits? Yes, because the markets will be better, better diversified. The market will, you will have fewer panics. You will have less contagion and systemic risk. You will have less volatility. A long-term investment is a long-term investment. However, liquid is the secondary market. It's never a short-term debt. You don't buy a 40-year bond in order to sell it in the next second. It just doesn't make sense. If you also consider transaction costs. You have less endogenous risk because the financial system is better diversified both in terms of plurality of operations, of institutions, and in terms of investments on offer, and in terms of capital committed to economic uses, to real econo uh, economy uses, and it battles transactionalization. Everything that diverts investment from a commission generation rationale and the short trading short term trading rationale of course short term trading creates lots of commission for financial institutions what's financialization financialization as far as i'm concerned is slicing and dicing all forms of investment including real economy investment in the name of liquidity generating, having lots of trading activity in order to generate commissions for the financial institutions and the financial institutions, uh, the financial institutions dictating the pace of the markets. Obviously the higher the leverage in a short termist market, the higher the rate of transactions. Okay, so Self-serving financial innovations, the dominance of financial institutions, obsession with commission generating income and short terms, and obsession with slicing and dicing, commoditizing everything in order to trade it and make it part of a financial transaction, that's probably self-serving. And even though allegedly has an information, the liquidity impact on the underlying markets, on the cash markets, probably it's a bet on the Kentucky Derby race and nothing else. The more you restrict that, the more stable and less volatile becomes the financial system. And the more you increase the plurality of the financial system, both in terms of market actors and investments, the more stable becomes the financial system because at the end of the day, if you want to describe it, it's no more than a very complex ecosystem where even regulation, and I'm in favor of regulation, I don't think that ecosystems can self-regulate themselves, and I'll explain what I mean in a second, but replacing all the functions of the ecosystem 
with a regulated public order, I think is false. You know, there are lots of uh, ancient civilizations, the Mayans, the Aztecs, that disappeared because the ecosystem changed. They didn't, they didn't provide for a bad day or a bad century with lots of drought and change of the weather and so on. So I do not believe that just relying on the, um, the self-regulating properties of an ecosystem is enough. That would make me an extreme libertarian at the end of the day. But I don't think that you can replace it just with ordering, just with fertilizers, and expect that will have become so much better, so much more resilient, so much more efficient. Probably you have added toxicity if you try to regulate everything. Now, if you just increase the flow of water to, this, um, to the ecosystem, probably you've done a, a good job. So I think that regulation should uh, start thinking about the big picture and leave a number of other things to the market. Now, that cannot be done because of collective action problems. It cannot be become in general because of collective action problems and because of the um, inherent inferior bargaining position that consumers and retail investors have vis-a-vis -vis financial institutions that create all these very complex products and so on. But if it is a straightforward, long-term investment commitment, which is also liquid, I do not see why regulator, uh, regulation should be restrictive and obstructive. I see no reason. And finally, I think as economics stands today in finance, we stand at a crossroads where we have fundamental disagreements of what financial markets are for. I think by overhauling the system and providing a very strong signaling about what financial markets are for brings us much closer to what financial markets, much closer to consensus as to what financial markets should be doing both in theory and practice. Thank you.